So some of this, you know, those of you that were here for the video or those of you that watched the other video at home, um, it, it got into all this stuff right here, right? Speakeasies, illegal bars. Actually, both of those videos, the one we watched in class and the other one, both talk, brought up uh, Texas Gyna, who ran a nightclub in New York City, called everybody a sucker. I don't know if you remember hearing that in the video. Um, so she was pretty famous, obviously, showing up in two... Uh, different videos like that. Um, but like uh, another video I used to show said uh, New Year's Eve uh, that was going to usher in 1927. The uh, New York Times, uh, there were literally five, like 5,000 advertisements for New Year's Eve parties at speakeasies in New York City. Okay. There's no way the government's going to shut down all those, you know, and they're just advertising it openly. You know what I mean? So, uh, especially New Year's Eve, uh, people look the other way. Uh, and people generally had a place. So, they, they be, would oftentimes become like private clubs. Okay, you still see these. I think there's a place here in Wichita. Uh, I forget the name of it. Uh, some of you parents might be members of it. It's like a club. Uh, and you could go there and have dinner. But you got to be a member to go there. Okay. Huh? There's a speakeasy under the Broadway. Broadway like it, it's like an old, it's kind of, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but uh, so these private clubs, um, so they would know your name. So they, you know, wouldn't have undercover cops coming in and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, anyhow, uh, for women, guys, this is obviously, this is like a sexual revolution. Um Prior to the 1920s, guys, for women to wear a skirt or dress that showed the ankle was risque. Okay, so these these dresses and skirts are going to shoot up to the knee, and in some cases, that's right, above the knee. Okay, and women um, are actually going to wear lipstick in public and smoke cigarettes in public. I know, this is crazy. <laughs> and, you know, for many old-fashioned people, they were like, this, this is wrong, you know. Um, now, obviously, these are rules that generally men came up with that women used to live by. Uh, well, and they said, you know what? We're not doing that anymore. We have the right to vote, and we don't need you. Um, so as you move to the 19, late 60s and 1970s, you'll see another uh, kind of liberation of women, okay? This is more of a fem feminist movement in the, in the early 70s that we'll see, okay? Things like bra burning and that sort of thing, okay? So, uh, but this is really uh, women letting their hair down, but not really, they're cutting it short uh, and, you know, doing as they please, all right? Um, and they were aptly named flappers. The music here is amazing. And um, I know everybody, you know, has different, enjoy, enjoys different music. Some of you guys listen to country. I don't get that, but people <laughs> listen to it. Uh, we are in Kansas. Um, but every type of music you look at today has was at some point impacted by this music of the 1920s. So whether it's classic rock, uh, hip hop, R&B, all of these are affected by jazz, blues, ragtime music. Um, I'm actually like a huge classic rock guy. So like Led Zeppelin, any Led Zeppelin people. I mean, there's so much blues in their music. Not every song, 
But if you listen to their albums, and it just oozes the blue. Uh, the Beatles were definitely impacted by these. Uh, Buddy Holly, as you move into the rock and roll, Elvis Presley, um, and so forth. And then, you know, like I said, hip hop today and so forth uh, brings in some of these elements as well. So uh, the music, music is great, and you can uh, dance to a lot of it. And dancing certainly was huge back then. Um, the swing dances and so forth. I mean, we go through eras of music in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, big bands, and so forth. My dad was born in 1929, so he loved the big bands, the orchestras. Okay, and then some of you that did the homework, you got to see, uh, read about stuff like the Harlem Renaissance and the Cotton Club in New York City and Harlem, and uh, some of the music musicians like Louis Armstrong and others that, um, who will we... The, they stand the test of time. You can still listen to that stuff today. Okay, some of the crap that's out right now will be gone, and nobody will ever listen to it again. You know what I mean? It doesn't stand the test of time, uh, like a lot of good music does. Okay. Did it, it just, just popped in my head. I'm sorry. Did any of you guys see this movie called Yesterday? About the beat like this? Yeah. They wake up one day, and there's only like three people on the planet that even remember the Beatles. Like everybody, the Beatles never existed, but these three people like know all their songs. And it's a fun movie, okay? Uh, where this guy starts playing Beatles music, and you're like, how did you write that? Where did they come up with that, okay? And so he becomes famous playing Beatles music. It's, it's a great movie. Uh, yesterday, it's called. Okay, um, so anyhow, um, Guys, for the really kind of for the first time, the majority of Americans have um, discretionary income. They have money left over at the end of the month. Okay, they have more time, so you're looking more at a 40-hour work week. Okay, so a lot of people have weekends off, and then they have money, and they want to be entertained. We love to be entertained in this country. And of course, the sound and motion picture, which you could pay a nickel to go to. People flooded. I mean, we're talking more than half the population went to the movies every week. Okay. And then, really, with sports, this really takes off in the 1920s. Okay. So, whether, whether it be college football, golf, boxing, uh, America's pastime, of course, baseball, um, the most famous football person was a coach, not a player. He was the coach of the Notre Dame Irish. What was his name? <laughs> Here's a movie one for you. Rudy? Rudy, yeah. Okay. It, raise your hand if you've seen Rudy. Okay. Listen, people. You have to see this movie. Okay. It, Dole, you haven't seen Rudy? You even used to play football, didn't you? Yeah. Holy cow. You like Notre Dame? Is that is that okay. Gosh, man, that movie is so good. It's it's based on a true story. Uh, and in the movie, Rudy Rudiger, who's like this really small guy that his dream was always to play football at Notre Dame. But you just don't get to play football at Notre Dame. So it's all of especially if you're an undersized, not very good athlete. First of all, you gotta get into Notre Dame, which is hard. And then you gotta make the team, which is really hard, you know? And so it's a great story. He gets on the field for like two plays. Four years, of five years of chasing that game. He gets on the field. Two plays. Yeah, he gets to come out of the tunnel. And they're in, you know, he knows the whole speech by Knut Rockney. Knut Rockney's the coach. Okay. And uh, he's the most famous person in college football. Okay. And uh, you guys know how big college football still is today. It's huge. Yes? Okay. Um, and then... Uh, in the video, they, they sh talked about this fight. Uh, Gene Tunney uh, versus Jack Dempsey, Philadelphia, in front of 120,000 people. Okay, we got any golfers in here? No golfers in here? Golf, uh, do you, any of you guys watch golf? I know it's not the most exciting thing to watch on TV. But, like, watching the Masters, to me, is like, I look forward to that every year. Because the course itself is part of the, the event. It's so beautiful, guys. Augusta National in Georgia, it's an amazing place. Okay? 
And uh, yeah, it's just it's it's wonderful. Well, that really took off in the 1920s. There's a couple good movies about that as well. We're talking about movies. There's a movie called The Greatest Game Ever Played, which is fantastic. There's one called The Legend of Bagger Vance, uh, which is really good. Um, and it kind of shows about, you know, how golf really took off early on. Uh, huge crowds for golf still to this day. Any you guys been to the Wichita Open? What's the, what's the game played in Augusta? It's called the Masters Tournament. Yeah, yeah. I've been to that. You went to the Masters? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know how hard it is to get a ticket to the Masters? My dad's from Augusta. Yeah. And we, my great uncle lives in Augusta. Yeah. So we got tickets. Nice. <laughs> nice. It wasn't very fun? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I stayed in the entire day. Yeah. 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 It was pretty though, wasn't it? Yeah. Savannah's better. Oh, Savannah's gorgeous. Anybody else been to Savannah? I just asked uh, General Sherman about Savannah, right? General Sherman, how he burned Atlanta on his march to the sea, got to Savannah and said, I can't burn the sea, it's too beautiful. Okay, so you still have a lot of the architecture from back then, uh, from the 19th century in Savannah. It is a gorgeous city. I went to the wedding there. My best friends got married. All of my family was on them. Yeah. Into, like, yeah. Nine, like, well, I went to college in, in Georgia. No way. Where'd you get Way. Uh, <laughs> uh, Georgia Southwestern University, which is uh, southwest Wait. of Atlanta. America's Georgia. Okay, so like, uh, Georgia, it's not Georgia Southern. Not Georgia Southern. Oh, okay. No. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a good school. Uh, yeah, Georgia. <laughs> I spent uh, two and a half years living there. And then I, I graduated in 91 from college and moved to Atlanta and actually lived up in uh, what's the big Stone Mountain? Lived up in Stone Mountain, which is really cool if you're ever in Atlanta to see Stone Mountain. That's horrible. Oh, it is. It is. Cool. It's, <laughs> it's, well, and the weather is it's so humid there. Um, it's just hot and humid. But people are nice and. Uh, you know, they have boiled peanuts and you buy day onions. And that's the two big things in Georgia. Boiled peanuts, which are nasty. What? I like peanut food. I love peanuts. I like in the shell, but not boiled. They're really good. Yeah, slime. Come on. <laughs> okay, all right. We're done with Georgia. <laughs> Let's talk about the Yankees, okay? I'm not a Yankees fan, but uh, 1927 Yankees, okay? You got two guys here. You got Babe Ruth, of course, and everybody in here has heard of Babe Ruth, yes? 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 <laughs> well, <laughs> you say a lot, okay? Uh, or anything else. I mean, he's like the most famous baseball player of all time, okay? Uh, and standing next to him is Lou Gehrig, okay? Now, Lou Gehrig was a magnificent baseball player. Uh, he's, he's big. He's, I mean, he's, he's just as big as Babe Ruth, but he's an athlete. I mean, he's like a linebacker. He's huge. Okay, hits from the left side, fast. I mean, just a great player. Um, some of you guys remember maybe eighth grade or something when they had the ALS challenge with the, the ice bucket challenge on people's heads. Well, ALS is nicknamed Lou Gehrig's disease. Okay, so when he got this disease, um, it was really hard uh, to watch him. Just kind of, he started to whittle away. You know. And there's one of these uh, most famous uh, moments in baseball history where he's playing his last game at Yankee Stadium. He's going to retire because he's, he's, he's getting sick. And um, he, he stands up to this massive crowd, and he said, I consider myself to be the luckiest man basically, to be able to do this. And, you know, um, he, he was a good human being, too, and a great baseball player. Uh, so these two guys led what was called Murderer's Row. So if you're a pitcher and you got to face these guys, now the cool, kind of interesting part of early baseball is they didn't have lights. So games usually start at 3.30. Um, so when you watch old footage, everybody comes to the game dressed in like their work clothes. So the people are wearing suits and ties and hats. And women are wearing dresses and, and uh Man, I tell you what, if you ever sat through a game in Kauffman Stadium, Kansas City, in August, in a day game, it's freaking hot. 
you know, and you get that swamp ass going on. Imagine wearing a three piece suit, you know, with that. Um, but people did. Um, so five o'clock in uh, lightning, late innings, the Yankees, the 27 Yankees, maybe the greatest team ever assembled. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so sports really take off. And obviously, we're still in that today. You know, I mean, we, we're still a, a huge part of our culture. Uh, even if you don't play sports, a lot of people enjoy watching their favorite teams and so forth. Okay. Um, and then, of course, Charles Lindbergh. And uh, they showed him in the video. Some of you may have been to the Smithsonian in uh, Washington, D.C., the Air and Space Museum. Uh, the Spirit of St. Louis was the name of his plane. It's hanging in the rafters there. Uh, Smithsonian. Uh, now, Lindbergh was an unknown flyer. He delivered mail for the U.S. Postal Service, so he flew delivered mail that way. Um, but there was this contest, $25,000 for the first person to fly across the Atlantic solo. And so he threw his name in the hat. Um, now, the plane is loaded down with fuel. It's very heavy. Uh, he barely clears the treetops at the end of the runway. Uh, and it goes, takes off in bad conditions because uh, there were other flyers that were planning on taking off that day. He said, I'm going. And some of them waited till the weather cleared. Okay? Um, and some of them never made it. So, like, there's one guy named Chamberlain that, you know, tried to fly across and nobody ever heard from him again. I mean, he perished. Okay? So, Lindbergh's 33 and a half hours, right, from New York to Paris. Now, have you guys ever stayed up for 24 hours in a day before? Like, all, you know, 24 hours, and then how do you feel the next day, right? You're tired. Um, now, guys, he's flying. Most of this isn't going to be at night, and most of it's over water and low altitudes. You know, he's flying under, you know, probably around 5,000 feet because um, the air gets thin. This is not a pressurized cabin. There's no windshield in the uh, – Spirit of St. Louis, just look out the front of the plane. You got to stick your head out the window, okay? So, and you guys like sleeping with like a humming sound in the background, like a fan going or something. Uh, my wife, when she gets on an airplane, I mean, as soon as she sits down and she takes off, she's out, bam, she's gone, okay? How do you stay away? You know, I mean, so he's drinking coffee. Uh, there's a movie about this called The Spirit of St. Louis, and uh, in the movie, it's, uh, the actor that plays him is. Uh, uh, the guy from uh, Every Time a uh, Bell Rings, an Angel Gets Its Wings. Oh, uh, oh, what's oh, his name? Oh, it's a wonderful life. Stewart. Stewart. Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart <laughs> plays Linda. Okay. And there's like this house fly, you know, like a little house fly. Flies into the cockpit. He's having like these long conversations, staying awake talking to this house. I don't know if that really happened, but that's in the movie. Okay, so uh, Lindbergh comes a household name. I mean, like, internationally, everybody knows who Lindbergh is. It's kind of like, you know, if you were asked today, like, if you were to at four corners of the planet and ask people who they, you know, that knew the same person's name, I mean, you might come up like the Pope, right? But who's like the most famous person in the world today? That's a household name. From Africa to Asia to... That would be a pretty good... I think Trump is probably the most famous person in the world today. Uh, but like in the 80s, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was a household name. Michael Jordan in the late 80s. And probably number two to Trump would be LeBron James. Does everybody in here know who LeBron James is? Yeah. Because basketball is huge internationally. Like in China, basketball is massive. I mean, it's, they love the NBA. Okay. Um, so I'd say probably LeBron James after Trump. Right? But everybody knew who Lindbergh was. He was an international hero. Okay. Now, there are some um, more controversial aspects of Lindbergh okay, that I'll mention right now. Uh, have you heard of the Lindbergh baby? So he married the uh, U.S. ambassador to Mexico's uh, daughter. His last name is Morrow. Um, and they had a baby. And one night on the second floor of their house, somebody 
put a ladder up next to the house and climbed into the window and stole the to kidnap the baby. Okay, and this is like one of the most famous people in the world. So the Lindbergh baby has been kidnapped. Okay, and so there's a ransom, and they never get the baby back. And eventually they find the shallow grave where the baby is, is been killed. It's dead. They did arrest somebody for it, um, but I don't know if we know for sure whether that was the person that did it or not. Uh, and then there's another kind of controversy with him. He's a flyer. He's an aviator, right? And as we start to move on to, towards World War II, as Nazi Germany comes to power, okay, Hitler comes to power, and they start invading their neighbors. Um, Lindbergh's has a fascination with the Luftwaffe, which is the German Air Force, okay? And really kind of throws his support behind Germany and not Britain. Okay, so for that reason, a lot of people will end up disliking him. Okay. And I'll, I'll, have, I'll have a slide on that a little bit later. Okay, so he is a well-known and controversial figure. Yeah? Do you know what the Lindbergh is? The white, white van version of the movie. The white? White van. Like the, oh. they, the, really? Yeah. The creepy white van? Yeah, yeah. his news reporters would just like post that and stuff so they would like put all the Russian actors in. Mm -hmm. And then like ever since then I was like. Creepy hey. white van? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear it all the time. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Did not know that. Okay. Who's that? Henry. Henry. Okay, we already know a little bit about Henry, right? So, guys, the factory was originally powered by, like, steam, then coal. And so now we have the electrified powered factory through just electricity. And um, now the electricity is coming from coal, generally. Okay. And so it just becomes more efficient. And I don't know if you remember learning about this guy last year. Uh, with Mr. Ferris or whoever you had, which is Fred, Frederick W. Taylor. Okay, so if any of you guys are thinking about getting into uh, like mechanical engineering, something like that, um, or uh, business management, where you know you try to become more efficient as, as a business. The more efficient you are, the more what you make. More money, yeah, more profits. Okay. And so uh, this guy, Frederick W. Taylor, uh, wrote this book, The Principles of Scientific Management, that helped create uh, a more efficient factory, okay? And we're still doing that today, right? Um, guys, if wages continue to increase, then we will find ways to create, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, or robots, or what have you, to do the job of human beings. Because it's more efficient, it's cheaper. Okay, uh, that's the way of the world today, and uh, it was the way of the world here, right? To make us more efficient. Um, when you get into some of you guys will study business, okay? And you look at different types of managing businesses. Uh, we have a really in interesting example right here in Wichita with Coke Industries. Uh, do any of you guys have family that work out of Coke? Okay. Um, Charles Koch uses what's called market-based management, okay? So um, they, they will look at corporate, different companies out there uh, to, to acquire that look like they will be profitable in the future, and they will buy those companies and make them more profitable. Uh, and some of those businesses, it works. Uh, Koch recently, I'd say about 10 years ago, bought Purina, which makes cat food, dog food, and stuff like that. It didn't go so well. They don't have Purina anymore. They sold it off, okay? Uh, but Georgia Pacific Paper is a company that they bought, okay? Uh, so that's, you know, that's been good for them. Um, farmland, uh, they make milk and stuff like that. Uh, cheeses, farmland, okay? Uh, Coke bought up some of that and so forth. But the other thing, they, how they manage Coke Industries is through uh, rewarding their employees. Uh, if they, if the employees help them be more profitable, then they reward the employee, which is like, that's what you call merit, okay? 
You know, like, so if you're a really good teacher, you get paid more. If you're not a good teacher, you don't get paid as much. Wouldn't that be great? Now, how do you measure that? Can you do it with tests? Like, how kids do on standardized tests? Measure it that way? Well, how, how do you know the kid's going to show up for try on the test? Or whether that kid ate breakfast this morning? Or what's going on in that child's life at home? Are you going to base a teacher's salary off a test that a kid takes? That's hard to do. You know what I mean? So you really have to do it with observation. You have to see it in action. Or, you know, ask the students, you know, whether they feel like they're learning in their classes. That sort of thing. I'm all for that. Merit. You get paid on merit. As our public school systems are not set up like that. You know that for teachers, right? Either is ours. Actually, ours is kind of little secret. We don't have a pay scale here. So, like, if after you work five years, you get, you get a raise. After 10 years, you get more. After 15, you, we don't have that. And the public schools, they have that. So, like, if you get a master's degree, your, your pay goes up automatically. It doesn't matter whether you're a good teacher or not. Does that make sense? So, like, when I finish my master's this year, there's no guarantee my salary will go up. You understand? But, what I understand, uh, they do pay um, some of the teachers more than others based on how good of a teacher they are. That's what I understand. I don't know if I'm in that group or not. Okay. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, that's good to try and retain good teachers. Okay. Uh, so this is really interesting. So a model, model T goes from assembling from 14 hours to assemble one car to 93 minutes with the assembly line, okay? One rolling off the assembly line every 90 minutes. So this is uh, the Ford factory. These are chassis, and they're on the assembly. And so as the chassis comes along, they add the tires, they add the steering wheel, they add all the stuff, right? And in 93 minutes, they can build a car. Now, we have robots that help us today. We build a car in 93 minutes today. No way, right? There's way too many electronics and we have computers on our cars now and flat screens and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so no, it takes a lot longer to build a car today. Uh, so by 1925, one car was rolling off the assembly line in the United States every 10 seconds, okay. which is pretty amazing. Now we're building all this stuff, guys. Now we got to sell it. We see the growth of this industry, advertising. Yeah, it had been around for a long time, advertising, but now it's mass media. So originally, you would have newspapers, you would have magazines, catalogs, stuff like that. Billboards have been around a long time. U.S. Postal Service has been around a long time. Uh, but then we get radio. Okay, and so radio advertising helps pay for people that are on the radio, okay, and um, for the program. So we see an increase uh, of one billion before the war to three billion dollars in advertising by 1929. And this is pretty common with most advertising. So whether they're selling you mouthwash or Mercedes Benz. They're going to try and sell you something besides the product or in addition to the product, promising you comfort, health, beauty, status. So take Mercedes Benz. What are you buying? Well, you're buying a nice car, right? But it's comfortable, beautiful, and it's kind of a status symbol driving Mercedes. You know what I mean? Um, mouthwash. You ever see mouthwash commercials? They try and make everybody think they have bad breath. So they'll guilt you into buying mouthwash. Okay. And then we get really good at this, guys. Buying on credit. Buy now, pay later. Dollar down. You can own it today for a dollar down. You just got to pay over the next few months. Okay. And then with automobiles, you can see by 1928. We owed one billion dollars on automobiles. Okay, so that's you know 
Now, credit cards were not a thing back then. Um, but you could buy, go to the grocery store and buy on credit. So you didn't have the money today, but when your paycheck comes in, you'll go and pay them what you owe them. Okay? Um, so stores did that. Uh, so it's kind of an honor system. You know what I mean? Um, I can remember in the 1970s, my mom, when they came out with credit cards, my mom had like a purse full of credit cards. Like she had one for J.C. Penney, she had one for Sears, she had one for Montgomery Ward, she had a diner's club for uh, eating out, diner's club credit card. That's still around. Uh, and I think they even had American Express, which a lot would take. Now, uh, I think Visa's won the war. Um, most people have visas. You have Discover Card 2 and others. Um, but Visa, I think, has won it. Now, guys, these things can be dangerous. Do any of you guys have one of these credit cards? Okay, you have a credit card or a debit card? I have one that's like paid by mom. Okay, yeah. Um, I have a Capital One Venture card, okay, and I get cash back on this. So I use this a lot. But what we do is we pay it off every month. Okay, this, this is where you get in trouble with credit cards, okay? So let's say you go to college and you're short on money, so you get a credit card and you buy your, your books for college, your college textbooks, $500 for college textbooks, okay? And you get the bill. And the bill says you only have to pay $10 this month on your $500. So you pay the $10. But there's 14% interest on your $500. So the bill you get next week, you owe $511. You only pay $10. And the, you know what they tell you how much you have to pay this month? $10. Again. So then something else comes up. You put another $500 on the credit card. They send you the bill and they say, uh, your minimum payment this, week, this month is $10. So you can see what happens. You know what I mean? People will put thousands and thousands of dollars on these. And the interest just keeps going up. Okay? And I've had friends that, you know, $30,000 in credit card debt. There's people all over this country that are doing that. You understand? They send them to you in the mail. I mean, no annual fee. Use our credit card. I use the crap out of this because I get cash back. So, like... My wife and I use credit card, and then next, you know, after about six months, it's like we can buy our plane tickets for our next vacation based on the points that we got from using our credit card. Stick it to the main. Yeah. Does the credit cash back work for the credit card? Everyone's different. So, like, we, our other credit card, we have two. The other one is South is a Southwest Airlines credit card. So, uh, you get points. So, like, the cash back on this one, on the venture, is for every $100 you spend, you get, like, a dollar back. Okay, so if you spend $1,000, you get, what, 10 bucks. And over six months, it adds up. 1% debt. Maybe two. I think this one has two. That's what the commercials say. With what's his name? Black guy? Samuel. What's his name? Samuel Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson. Okay. He's the pitch man. Okay. All right. So, all right. We got this. Now, guys, this, to this point, we've talked about two things that are causes of the Great Depression. One, tariffs. Two, war debts. Three, right here. This is the last slide of this module. Wages rise 26%. That's good, right? People are making more money. Yes. Productivity rises 40% over the same time period. So what that basically means is we're producing more products than can be consumed. And we start to see the effects of this by 1927. Okay, we start to see overproduction. So if you own a car lot, you sell cars, new cars, okay, and we're producing all these cars, and wages are not keeping up, so you have more inventory on your lot than normal because they're not selling. So what do you call the factory and tell them to do? Yeah, cut production. We don't need as many cars this month. 
And next month, we don't need as many cars. So slow down production at the auto, auto plant. What do they have to do when they slow down production? They lay people off. We don't need as many workers. So those workers don't have paychecks to buy cars anymore or anything else. See how this will start a downward spiral. Slow down in production means less wages. Less wages means slow down in purchasing power. No purchasing power, slow down production more. And it goes down and down and down. So we start to see it by 1927, but people are in denial. Things have been so good for the, you know, for the last six years. Things have been so good. People don't start to realize there's starting to be some serious flaws in the economy. And then you add tariffs to that, which means we're going to start exporting less goods overseas, which means less production here, too. You follow me? It's, it's going to be a nightmare is what it's going to turn into. Okay? And that starts on our next slide, which is module 18. Oh, I did have one more slide there. That was Mr. Ebright's first vehicle. Okay. Um, my dad didn't want me to die in a car accident, so he bought this from an old lady. See, if I get in a car accident in this, who's going to win? That's got 460 cubic engine in it, 460 horsepower. It's massive, okay? It's a tank. We called it the Yellow Submarine. I fit 13 people in that one. Okay. It was awesome. It was a great car. So I blew the transmission. What the gas mileage on that? Oh, uh, that gas was cheap. <laughs> it was like a dollar twenty-five. You know, or yeah, like a dollar something back then. Yeah. In the eighties. Okay. Yeah, and there was another guy at my school that had one just like it. Both had yellow, but he had a big old Lincoln too. It was a great car. Um, had an eight-track, right, in it? Okay. All right, where's my... I got to open a new one here. Guys, we won't do this whole slide. Uh, we're going to get into some stuff about the stock market. I think it's uh, probably important for you to understand the stock market before uh, I explain it. This is going to... What is wrong? Thank you. Okay. When you're watching uh, ESPN and you see the scores come across the bottom of the screen, what do you call that? It's called a ticker, right? Yeah. And when you're watching CNBC or Fox Business News and you see that come across, it's the ticker. Okay. Now, the Wichita Eagle used to have two full pages uh, when it used to be a newspaper and um, of all the stock quotes from the day before. So you could look at, at your stocks. Now we have the internet, so you just Google, you know, how my stocks did, okay? Uh, you can find out right now. You know what I mean? Pull up your phone, boom, there it is, okay? How much money am I making or losing today? Okay, you don't have to wait for the newspaper the next day, okay? Now, when we talk about stocks, guys, this is um, foreign to some people. Some people understand this. Um, do any of you own any stocks okay we got, okay good we didn't have anybody in second hour so this is probably something your parents helped set up or maybe you're doing it on your own your day trading or something okay uh which you know if if you don't need the money i guess it's okay to gamble in the stock market uh, but the stock market is legalized gambling and what you're gambling on is the future of that business either the near future or the long-term future of that business when you buy their stock, okay? You've got two types of companies. You've got private companies and you've got public companies, okay? Coke Industries is the second largest privately owned business in the United States, behind number one Cargill, okay? Both are headquartered where? Wichita, Kansas. I think they, I mean, they have a headquarters here, I believe. But they may have plants up there too, but I think their home office might be here. I'm sure. I might be wrong. What if, what if both? What? What are like the, what are the 
Coke? Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, they're in a lot of different areas, but their biggest business is pipelines. Okay. Uh, and then they've really grown what my wife works in is their fertilizer company. Um, they make, uh, to make fertilizers, you got to take ammonia, uh, nitrogen, and you mix the chemicals and you make little pellets for fertilizer. I don't know the science. Well, my wife does. Yes. What's the other one? Uh, for coke, the pipelines are for, oh, for Cargill. They need meats. Yeah. Mainly agriculture. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say coke uses ethanol. Ethanol, yes. Right. Ethanol, ammonia. Oh, yeah, the ethanol from corn. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where your family member kind of in that yeah, business? My dad, <laughs> Flint Hills Resources. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oil and gas are the, the two biggest things. Um, okay. Then the publicly traded companies. Okay. Let's take Amazon. Okay. Everybody knows Amazon, right? And everybody knows Jeff Bezos. Okay. Now, can you and I buy Amazon stock? Yes. yes. There are millions of shares out there that you can buy. Jeff Bezos controls 51% of the company, 51% of the stock. That's what makes him one of the richest people in the world because his Amazon stock is so valuable. Okay? Once he gives up more than 50% of the stock, he no longer has a controlling interest. So uh, Facebook's the same way. Mark Zuckerberg controls 51% of the stock. Okay, now if you want to go public and have somebody else run the company for you, say I'm going to keep 40% of the stock, but I'm not going to run the company anymore. I'm going to turn it over to a board of directors, and we're going to hire a CEO and a CFO, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, and so forth, and they're going to run the company. And their job as a publicly run company, guys, is to produce results for the shareholders. So when you buy a share of stock in Amazon, you own part of that company. Now, it may be just a small sliver of that company, but you own part of that company. You're a shareholder. Okay, so let me take uh, an example you guys are pretty familiar with uh, is Boeing. Right? What do they make? They make aircraft. Okay. And uh, they used to be based here. Some of you might have family that work for uh, Spirit Aerosystems. Okay which is kind of a spin-off of Boeing. And uh, so Boeing sells planes, makes and sells planes. Okay, so let's say we're gonna buy some Boeing stock. Okay, I got $1,000 saved up, I'm gonna buy some Boeing stock, okay? Solid company, okay? Boeing is trading for $50 uh, per share. Okay, I got $1,000, how many shares can I buy? 200 shares, or is it 20 shares? 20 shares, come on, tell me out, math people. 20 shares, okay? Now, let's say news breaks that Boeing has, uh, uh, is gonna fill an order from Singapore Airlines for 4737 MAX jets. That's gonna keep Boeing and Spirit busy for a couple of years, filling that order. Okay, so the value of that company, the perceived value of that company is better. It's in a good situation. It's going to be solid for a few years. No problems, right? So the next day after you buy these shares, that news comes out and you look at the ticker and you see that Boeing is now selling for $55, $55 a share. Nice. So I own 20 shares at $5 a piece. I just made... I'm up a hundred bucks. Now, did I have to get out of bed that morning to make a hundred bucks? Did I have to go to work to make that hundred bucks? No, I'm putting my money to work for me. It's great. Yeah, okay. Then there's a news story that flashes across CNN. 737 Max crashes, everybody on board dead. Two weeks later, another 737 malfunctions. Heroic pilot lands place plane safely. Nobody dies. A month later, 
737 MAX explodes in air. Uh-oh. The FAA grounds all 737 MAX airliners, airline companies across the world, the globe, refuse to fly these planes until they figure out what's going on with them. Uh-oh. I need to sell my Boeing stock. It's at $55 a share. I call my broker. Now, guys, there's going to be millions of people trying to sell their Boeing stock. You understand? So these are the people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange saying, I got a thousand shares of Boeing I want to sell for $54. $53 nobody's buying okay so you, your broker calls i can't sell it at 53 I can, you know what do you want me to do uh sell it for 50 i'll break even i got 10,000 shares of boeing 50 bucks anybody no uh 48 43 40? Yeah. Right there, bam, 40. Okay. Jason's buying low. Okay. $40. And, and hopefully Boeing will come back, right? You know, it's gonna it's gonna rebound because they're gonna figure this engineering crap out that they screwed up, yes. Okay, now I, I lost fifteen dollars a share times twenty. Fifteen times twenty, I'm down what? How much? Three hundred dollars. My initial investment was thousand. Now it's worth 800. Okay? Because you were plus 100. You were up to 1100. Now you're down to 800. So this is where the term don't put all your eggs in one basket comes from. But the most important thing to understand for the purposes of understanding the stock market crash here, guys, is a share of stock is only worth but somebody else is willing to pay you for it. If nobody's willing to pay you for that stock, what is it worth? Nothing. Okay. And when there's a panic and everybody's trying to sell at the same time, we got a problem. That's what's going to happen on the 24th, again on the 29th of October 1929. Now, for the purposes of yourselves and your futures, a lot of Americans do not participate in the stock market. Now, that has changed some as companies have gone to using 401k as a retirement benefit for employees. 401ks are generally invested in the stock market. Okay, so people, even though they don't get to manage those very much, maybe change their allocation. So, like on a 401k, guys, at Bishop Carroll, we have four choices. We're, so we got 100% of our money that we're investing in our 401k. The company's going to match that with some money, free money. So if you ever get offered a 401k at a job, do it. It's extra money on top of what you're being paid. Now, it's forcing you to save some of your check. So your check's going to be smaller, but you're saving for the future. You understand? 401k, do it, okay, even if they're not very good at it. Guys, now, seriously, yeah, I've been here 23 years, man. My 401k, as far as how fast it's grown compared to my wife's 401k, code, it's not even close. Okay, those people over there know how to manage money. Okay, now listen, so I get large cap, small cap, international, and bond. So like you pick, okay, I'll go, I'll go 25% and each of them. Or I go 130 or 140, you know what I mean? You just mix them up. That's the, that's the only decision I have to make. And I change that like once a year. That's it. So that's a 401k. So a lot more people are in the stock market. This is large corporations, small emerging corporations, international stocks and bonds, which are Usually less return, but they're safer. Okay, less risk involved. Okay, so uh, as you get older, you move more money here, less risk involved. When you're younger, you're going to have more money here and here. The 
because there's a chance for more growth than these, oftentimes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, international. Uh, yeah. Okay, so like emerging markets, to look at you know stocks in India, China, other places uh, where their economies are taken off. Um, okay. Now, the other thing you can do without putting all your eggs in one basket, and this is what most of you will do, this is what most people do, and that is buy a mutual fund, okay? So, um, you usually start with a mutual fund, you need $2,500 or $2,000. So, when you guys graduate from college, okay, you get that first good job, all right? Nice paycheck, sweet. You go out and buy a house, you're going to save a little bit. Milk your parents as long as you can, okay? Rent is expensive. Don't, I mean, you can rent if you want to, but guys, rent is so high right now, you might as well be putting stuff towards a house uh, and building your assets, okay? So milk mom and dad as long as you can, save some money, get a down payment, buy your first house, okay? And then make sure you have enough, come out of your check each month to go into your mutual funds. Okay, so that you can start to begin to retire, you know, work towards your retirement. Okay, now if McDonald's, so this is add up to a hundred percent, it doesn't here, but just say it did. Okay, I got seven percent of my twenty five hundred dollars in McDonald's, seven percent in Amazon, five percent in General Mills, and so forth. So if McDonald's has a bad year and General Mills has a good year, they offset, they balance each other out. Okay, so all your eggs are not in one basket. Now, the number one choice of buying a mutual fund today is called a Roth IRA. That's an individual retirement account. You have traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. So you're at, what, what, where are I? Okay, you guys ever seen an Edward Jones in this city? They're on every street corner, Edward Jones, okay, or Charles Schwab. It's, it's called a stockbroker. So you go into one of those places like Charles, uh, Edward Jones, say, hi, I'd like to invest some money for retirement. First thing they're going to tell you, you need to buy a Roth IRA. Okay, because the Roth IRA, when you get this money out, guys, this is for when you're 67. The new retirement age is 67. Okay, I think you can start getting money out of your Roth at 62 without penalties. You take that money out before you're 62, you pay penalties. Uh, while you were sleeping, what was it before though? 65. Who uh, decided that? The government. So Guys, Social Security, it, it, it's based for Social Security. So you, you get full Social Security at 67. You can take it early at 62, okay, but you get a smaller check each month from Social Security. If you wait till you're 70 to get your Social Security check, it'll be a bigger check. Yeah, I thought Roth was independent. Is that yeah, this is independent. Okay. But there are rules for your, it's a retirement account. So there's rules. And that rule is you can borrow against your I, your 401k or your IRA, but you got to pay taxes and penalties. Okay. The nice thing about the Roth is when you do start to use it at, say, 62, it's tax free. There's no taxes on the gains you've made. Pay the tax up front. Okay? That's the best thing ever. Okay? I'm serious. It's the best thing ever. Because capital gains taxes, who knows what they're going to be when we're 62. 67. You know what I mean? I'll for, further explain on uh, Thursday, tomorrow. Okay? Good? Investing with Mr. Newberg.